All right. Let's put this in. <laughs> Okay, so today we're going to talk about chemical fundamentals. So we're going to do a little, little bit of review of Chem 2 and the equilibrium ice tables. So if you can dig through all of that in your notes, you can see that we've got lots of ice tables in today's lecture. So we're going to be talking about this idea of sample prep. So when samples come in, what do we do with them? If it's, if it's the best case and your matrix effects are minimal, like if you have, um, you know, a, a powder, you know, white powder that's water soluble, you just dissolve it, put it right on a liquid chromatograph or gas chromatograph, and you're ready to go. So there's no matrix effects, really. You just have crystalline powders that are easily dissolved. Um, if you have a, a surface that is, um, you know, needs to be wiped, like you're, you're going to gather evidence on this tabletop, well, you wipe the tabletop down, and now you have a heterogeneous surface. So your sample is on the filter, You've got to dissolve it off the filter or the white. Um, you may have homogenization that needs to happen. So you've got maybe a tissue sample and you want to test for an analyte in that tissue. You've got to grind it up to break up all the cellular material. So that's called homogenization. They have little mini blenders that go in and just blend it all up and make it a, a, a break up all the cellular material or they even have ultrasonic um, homogenizers. So you can destroy the 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 you know the cellular matrix and release everything into solution centrifuge it down and then you can sample the, the supernatant and then you have lab sampling if you get lots of like a large seizure of something you're not going to analyze all of it and so you break it down into smaller lab samples and then once we have the analytes in solution how do we separate them further so that's what we're going to be talking about today it's called partitioning really the today and, and Thursday. So I, I talk about letting Le Chatelier's taxi drive. It's gonna drive our analyte to one side or the other. And in the next lecture, we're gonna start talking about aqueous and solvent um, uh, separations. So y'all did that in organic, I think. Did you do like ether extractables? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you had water and ether layers, you had organic layer, aqueous layer, and we control what goes into the organic or aqueous layer using pH. So that's the equilibrium piece. So we're letting Le Chatelier's principle drive things in the aqueous layer or into the organic layer. And so that's what we're, today we're gonna to talk about some of the pH and, and, and equilibrium chemistry. And the next time we'll talk about the, the aqueous and solvent solubility. So we wanna maybe get the analyte from a matrix or get an analyte <clears throat> from some interfering effect or maybe one analyte from a bunch of other analytes. And so we're trying to sort of separate them before we analyze them. And, and so that's what we're doing with partitioning. So we have this general equilibrium constant that you're all familiar with. We've had this in almost every chemistry course, this equilibrium constant where you have products over reactants raised to the power of their coefficients. Um, and so whenever K is much greater than one, then products dominate. So this, I'm just sort of reviewing the material that you should know. So again, if K is much greater than one, the numerator is much greater than the denominator and the numerator has the products. And, and vice versa, if K is much less than one, like 10 to the minus 15, 10 to the minus five, that means the denominator is 10, you know, 10,000 times greater than the numerator. It's 10 to the minus five, okay, or yeah, 100,000. So what? Well, acid base, solubility, redox equilibria, these are all useful for partitioning the analytes. We'll talk mostly about acid base um, partitioning in this course. So let's talk a little bit about acid base and the pH scale. Here's the um, several common materials that you have around the house. You know, things like household ammonia, which is very basic, household bleach, sodium hydroxide. Um, even like oven cleaner, <clears throat> very, very basic, uh, lime water, um, milk of magnesia, which is like uh, antacid, again, pretty basic, baking soda is up closer, it's almost, almost neutral, neutral is right here in the middle range of, of uh, pH, or the concentration of hydro, hydro, hydronium ion is 10 to the minus 7, so the minus log of that is 7, so that pH scale, pH 7 is, is neutral water, you know, saliva, blood, 
sweat, tears, all of those things are near near neutral pH. Rain is slightly acidic, more acidic in some areas, obviously, because of environmental emissions, nitric oxides and sulfur oxides. Then you get into some of the black coffees, or like a Costa Rican coffee, which might even be a little higher in acid. And then you get up here to Coca-Cola. Oh my gosh. You know, look at that. It's so acidic. pH of three or maybe 2.8. And and so that's why I have the little Coke label here that you've, um, you know, if you zoom in, you see that phosphoric acid. Now somebody's played a joke here. They, they put poison <laughs> on there. Like they're trying to like make you not drink Coke. Okay, and perhaps you've gotten this email, right? So it says, in many states, the highway patrol carries two gallons of Coke to remove blood from the highway after a car accident. I don't believe that, but anyway. Um, you could put a T-bone steak in a bowl of Coke and it'll be gone in two days. Have you seen any of these emails? They're trying to like scare you away from drinking Coke, um, cleaning corrosion from battery terminals or, or removing grease from clothes or loosening rusty bolts. It makes it sound like Coke is the worst thing on earth that you could put into your body, you know. And, uh, but what's funny is if you look up here, this is where Coke is. Look at gastric juice, the pH of one. I mean, your stomach has hydrochloric acid in it. So you know what? If you put a T-bone steak in your stomach, it'll be gone as well. You know, if you, if you were to throw up on your battery terminals, they would clean the corrosion off. If you got a rusty bolt, just, you know, ah, and then they, you can get the rust off because your stomach's way more acidic than Coke. So, you know, they're trying to scare you away. You're taking something that's a pH of three and putting it into something that's a pH of one. It, it, the Coke's problem with your body is not because it's acidic. Phosphoric acid is not a strong acid. So I just thought it was funny. Whenever I read this in a while, it's just like people don't even know that your stomach is so acidic, way more than Coke. Now, some of the other ingredients, uh, who knows, uh, could be bad. So here's some polyprotic acid. So phosphoric acid is one of those polyprotic acids. It's got three acidic protons, H3PO4. The first one comes off, again, around pH 3, 7.5 times 10 to the minus 3. So the pHs of these different pieces, or the pKa's, or the minus logs of these numbers, gives you the, the pH range of when you go past that proton coming off. And so when you go past uh, a pH of 3, then you're losing this proton. When you go past a pH of 8, you're losing this one. When you go past a pH of 13, you're pulling the third one off. So you've got to get a really basic solution, a high pH, to get that third proton off of phosphoric acid. Okay. And so what you're left with is the phosphate anion, PO4, 3 minus. And sometimes you see on a, a box like a, a powder or, or maybe even cement, it has this in it. You see trisodium phosphate. Now that's a pretty caustic thing, a pretty caustic salt, because we've taken all three protons off and put three sodiums on there and made a salt out of it. And so if you put that in water, it's a very basic solution because it wants that third proton. So it's going to steal that third proton from, from water. And, and so it's going to make the solution very, very basic. So you put trisodium phosphate in water, it's going to make a very basic solution. If you mess with concrete, which has trisodium phosphate in it, to help with the, the concreting process, uh, definitely wear gloves. I, I didn't do that one time. I thought that's just a small exposure, uh, putting in a basketball goal, and I, I just didn't have gloves around the house. So I, I used my hands. Well, that basic solution saponified or, or turned the fat in my skin to soap. And then when I washed my hands off, it washed all that fatty acid out of my out of my skin and dried it out like crazy. Now I've had dry hands before, but never like this. It shrank my skin. I couldn't straighten my hands out for the next day or so because it felt like my skin was going to crack. So that's what base will do to you. I've had acid on my hands before. It might sting. I wash it off. It's not that big of a deal. You get base on your hands, it feels soapy, doesn't it? You know, why does it feel soapy? It's because it's turning the moisturized fats in your skin to soap. So you feel that soap. That's you, you're, you're feeling. <laughs> it's, it's tearing apart your skin. So base is way worse than acid in terms of our bodies, our skin, our external skin. Yeah. So I would, again, I'm, I'm not as worried about acids as I am about bases. 
So then uh, let's, let's review some of the ice table calculations. So here's an example of the problem. Calculate the pH of a two molar solution of amphetamine. So here's the pKa 9.8. Now this is so typical. We have a molecule that is a base. How do I know it's a base? Well, you gotta look at the, at the name and the mean. Okay, so somewhere on this molecule is an NH2, an amine. And when it reacts, it's going to form an NH3+. Plus. Okay, so when it's protonated, it'll form an NH3+. Plus. The pKa, typically the pKa's are what are listed. It's the, it's the pKa for this species here, for the acid form of the base. So we're, it's, it's kind of a mess in terms of, of what you're given in the problem. You're given a base that wants to accept a proton, and then you're given the, 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 um, the pKa, which is the acid dissociation con constant for the reverse reaction. So there's always a little extra work than you had to do in, in Gen Chem 2. Okay, so let's walk through it piece by piece. So here's Ka and Kb as they relate to Kw. So you have to know that equation in your head. Like you've got to know how Ka and Kb are related. Here we're given pKa. If we want to know what pKb is, then we can, we can, um, well, you'll see the calculation of, of Kb. Uh, we could take the minus log of those. And so the minus log of Kw is pKw. Uh, Kw is 10 to the minus 14. And so the minus log of that is 14. Ka, Kb, we take the minus logs of those, we have the pKa and the pKb. So we could just take 14 minus the Ka and get Kb. So over here, this is 14, this is 9.8 plus pKb. So that would be an easy way to find the pKb, is just to subtract 9.8 9 from 14. Up here, this is 10 to the minus 14, and that's equal to 10 to the minus 9.8. You see what I did there? Here's 9.8 over here, which is equal to the minus log of Ka. So this is the anti-log of that number. So you change the sign and take the anti-log, and it's that number times Kb. So if I wanted Kb, I could just divide 10 to the minus 14, divide that by 10 to the minus 9.8. So working with Ka's and Kb's has to be second nature when you're this far into the chemistry degree. So review. So here's the ice table and here's our reaction. Always write out your reaction. This would be the amphetamine here, reacting with water, making the protonated form plus hydroxide. And so this is a basic reaction. We're reacting with water and we're accepting a proton. So it's acting like a base and producing hydroxide. We have a two molar solution of B and we need a KB for this reaction, which we can calculate one of two ways. And we can write out the equilibrium constant expression. All right, we have the BH plus, OH minus divided by B. We have Kw over Ka, so 10 to the minus 14 over 10 to the minus 9.8. And this is our, K, our uh, Kb, 6.3 times 10 to the minus 5. So there's, there's our, our Kb. We have all of our species here. We start out with zero of the base and zero of the hydroxide. And then I notice I have a minus x on the left and a plus x on the right. So Wherever this arrow is, that's where the signs change from minus to plus, just to review. Now we get down here at the bottom, we have two molar solution minus this tiny little x, which is roughly equal to two. Over here we have zero plus x, anything, if, if zero is plus anything, that thing is significant because zero is zero, right? So if I add even a tiny little thing to zero, it's significant. So we we have x down at the bottom, and same here, 0 plus x is x. And so we can write out our equilibrium constant this way. So x squared over 2 is equal to kb. So we can solve for x. It's the square root of 2 times the ka 
And so here's our X. Now we can check our work at this point. We assume that this X was small and we just solve for X. So let's check our work. It's essentially 0.01. So we're only half a percent off, right? 1% would be 0.02. So that's pretty good. I'm happy with that assumption. I assumed X was small. It showed out to be one in the last decimal place of what I know. I know it's 2.00. So, you know, it's really 1.99, <laughs> close enough to two for me, okay, and for our work. So that's the POH, but I'm not asked for that. I, up in the problem, I'm asked for the PH. So how do I get there? If I've got the, if I've got the hydroxide ion concentration and I want the PH. Okay, I could find the POH, which is the minus log of that number. So 1.9, that's the POH. Well, remember that everything that's done in aqueous solution is governed by the autoionization process of water. So if the hydronium ion concentration goes up, the hydroxide ion concentration has to go down because the product of those two things in water is equal to a constant. So this is the thing that governs the pH-POH relationship. So if I take the minus log of all of these, then I end up with the pKW, which is 14, is equal to the pH plus the pOH. And so I could just subtract this from 14. So pKW minus pOH is equal to the pH, so 12.05. So if I have a two molar solution of this amphetamine in water, then it's going to produce a pH of 12.05. It's pretty basic. It's going to steal a proton from water and make that H3, H3 plus. Good review. This seems familiar. Okay. Remember the one that you hate of this. What is the one that you hate? And you have to do the quadratic formula. Okay, so let's do one of those. Now, one way to know if you have to do the quadratic formula or not is if the C base over the KB, in this case, is greater than 100, then this assumption is okay. So what is C base? Well, this is the... The, the one given in the problem, we call it the nominal. Oh, why did I put him? I need an end. Nominal. The nominal concentration. What does nominal mean? It's another word for name. So it's like, it's the, it's the name we give that concentration. Is it accurate? No, it's really 1.99, but we said it was two. So if we made up a solution, we got onto the balance, we weighed out a certain amount, and we made a two molar solution, and that's what we wrote on the bottle. But that's before it comes to equilibrium. So that's what's on the label. So we would call that C base. So we'll just call, for concentration, we'll just call that C base. So that's this initial one, or the nominal concentration right here. So C base. And so I can take that C base number and compare it to KB. And if that ratio is greater than 100, then this assumption works. It gives you less than 5% error if it's right at 100. Okay. So that's a nice thing. I don't know if they're ever ex that explicit in your Chem 2. When I teach Chem 2, I say this is the criteria. When you go past that, when C base is greater than your KB or when C acid is greater than your KA, by more than a hundred times, then you, you're, you're okay with that assumption. It's when you have really small concentrations of C base, base or C acid that you have to take into account the quadratic formula. Okay, so this, and then percent ionization, we calculate that a lot. So what is a percent? A percent is always a part over a whole, a part over a whole. So we want the ionized piece over all of it. So the ionized piece is the BH plus, and all of it is the B plus BH plus. So this is all of the base pieces on the denominator. That's the whole. It's everywhere there's a B. And then on the top is the ion. So if we were doing an acid, it would be the anion on top. And then the parent acid and the anion on bottom. So bottom contains the whole. The top contains the part. We can put our concentrations in here. 0 0.01 over 2. That was 100%, so we're 0.56%, not 56%, but 0.5% ionized. So not very much base is ionized.
so that's that's sort of the basic level of ice table. Any questions before we go up a notch in difficulty? Okay, let's have fun with the quadratic formula. Okay, so what if that solution was 0. 0.0025 molar, so a tiny amount of amphetamine? What's the pH? Well, in this case, we've got a really small amount, and so we're going to have to do the quadratic formula. We have 0. 0.0025 here, 0 and 0, so we set up the same ice table, change rows are the same, but down here now, we have that minus x that we can't get rid of. We can't assume that that x is small relative to the, the C base or 0 0.0025. So we have this situation. So we've got to get this in the standard form. So let's put it, put all our species into our equilibrium constant expression. So over here, I put, again, on the top, we have x times x. So that's x squared. And in the bottom, we have the 0 0.0025 minus x. We need to get that in standard form where it has 0 equals ax squared plus bx plus c. So just a little bit of algebra here. And so now we have it in the standard form. So we have to know the quadratic formula. And so here's the quadratic formula. If it's in standard form of ax squared plus bx plus c, then here's the roots of x minus b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a. And so we have this funny plus or minus. Did y'all learn the terminology on how to keep track of those? You can label one x plus and the other x minus. And so that's sort of the little subscript plus or minus tells you which one you used. And so you just go ahead and calculate these. Now it's pretty tedious to write all this out, especially with the scientific notation, but this is all of the pieces, there's b, b squared, 4. Now, a is equal to 1, so I just have, a, have c here. And again, 2a, a is equal to 1. So, so it's simple in that respect. I always hate it when, when this difference comes out negative because I'm taking the square root of a negative. But so far, in terms of concentrations, I haven't come into that situation uh, ever before. If you run into that, you've made a mistake somewhere. You've used the wrong constant. Maybe put B in there in, instead of 4AC, maybe you put 4BC or something like that where you've, you've screwed up. So if you get a negative root inside your square root or negative value inside your square root on one of these concentration problems, you've probably made a mistake. And so don't get mad at me or, or throw your hands up. Go back and look to make sure you've got the algebra correct. Anyway, so what do we do now? We have two roots. And, and so here's the Sudoku piece, right? You got to you got to solve the problem. You got to figure out what to do. One of these concentrations is negative, though. And so that doesn't make any sense. So if x is negative, that means we put this base in solution and we got more base. Like <laughs> the concentration went up. We're trying to subtract x and x is negative. So we put base in there and then base was just created out of nowhere. So that's nonsense. So we just throw that one out and we use the the point zero 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 three six seven so now that's that's our x that's our hydroxide ion concentration take the minus log of that and we get the poh subtract that from 14 and we get 10.56 last time it was 12 now it's 10 we have less concentrated base so we have less basic solution so that's not that bad but it seemed worse when you're a freshman or a sophomore didn't it yeah so this just a bit of review. And so then we go back up there and we can put, you know, we can subtract this from the 0 0.0025. And so that's the, the amount of base that's still left. Here's the amount of um, the, the conjugate acid. And here's the amount of hydroxide. And so again, part over whole, this is the part. So 0 0.0367 divided by the sum of these two squares, and it's 14% ionized. We have a little less base in there. And so um, on average, or, or let's see, as a proportion, more of it is ionized. Any questions on this one? Okay, good. So now let's put it in... Uh, in a situation where we drive the reaction forward. 
So it's kind of like the titration calculations. Remember that those, when you're doing equilibrium and then you get into titrations, you're like, oh shoot, now I've got two steps to my calculation. I have to put in the, the strong acid and I've got to neutralize the system and then I got to do equilibrium. So it's two parts. You do the, the neutralization and you do the equilibrium. That's in the titration. This is kind of the same way, only this is what I'm talking about with Le Chatelier's taxi. So here we have calculate the concentration of neutral amphetamine that remains in an acidic solution of pH 2. So this is uh, pH of 2. So that's the equal to the minus log of the H3O plus concentration. All right. So I changed that that uh, two to a minus two and put it, you know, 10 to that. So 10 to the minus two is the hydrox hydronium ion concentration. So this is 10 to the minus two right here. You see that? 10 to the minus two, 0 0.01. So that's where this number came from. It came directly from this pH right there. And I want to put that on the reactant side. So notice how I've rewritten my equation. I've got B plus H3O plus gives BH plus and H2O. So since I've got acid that I'm putting in the solution, uh, I need to write the reaction where I can incorporate that acid. So I have my neutral amphetamine, 0 0.0025 molar, plus this amount of acid. And then I, I start the reaction initially with 0 BH plus. So you know, what if BH plus is what we want to detect? We can push this all the way over to the right by putting it in acid. So when adding acid, I'm driving this reaction all the way to the right. And so let's do this. Let's say from this initial, let's push it 100%. So I have these two reacting. So that means the minus X. Here's my arrow. That's where the signs change. So this is a plus X. And and how do I get them to go 100%? I take this one down to zero. So that's the limiting reactant problem. See, I have more acid than base. And so I'm going to run out of the base first. So I take the base all the way to zero. And if the base goes all the way to zero, I solve for X. X is 0 0.0025. And once you find that X, it's X across that whole row. So X is equal to 0 0.0025. So here I have 0 0.01 minus that. So I end up with 0 0.0075. And here I have zero plus that. So I have 0 0.0025. So does everybody understand that this pushed it all the way to products? Because I, the base went to zero. So I've pushed it as far as I can go. But nature hates those zeros. You've heard of people say nature hates a vacuum. This is kind of like a vacuum in the base. And it's going to suck that reaction backwards a little bit. Now, we could rewrite this as a second problem with the base and everything, or we could just leave it like it is and, and run this equilibrium backwards. So this is our new initial. You see, I've, I've labeled it over here. This is the new initial for a new ice table. I have I, you know, C, and E here. So... I'm going to run this reaction backwards by making this negative. This is going to decrease a little bit. This one's going to increase a tiny amount, and this is going to increase a tiny amount. Now, it's going to only move a little bit, so this X is pretty insignificant. We let that reaction run backwards, and I end up with 0 0.0075 plus a minuscule amount still gives me 0 0.0075. And 0 0.0025 plus a minuscule amount is only going to give me that. And then this one, zero plus anything, is going to be significant. So I get equal to x. So do you see how we're letting this run backwards? Now, what is the equilibrium, uh, you know, constant expression for this guy? This is BH plus reacting with water, making H3O plus and, and the base. Well, that's the Ka reaction. Products over reactants, we have ba the base times the hydroxide, hydronium ion concentration divided by the parent um, conjugate acid. And that's that Ka, which is that pKa was 9.8. So 10 to the minus 9.8 is Ka. 
and that's equal to X times the hydronium ion divided by the BH plus. So rearranging all of this, uh, we get 5.3 times 10 to the minus 11. Tiny, tiny number. And so this was a good assumption. You know, this was 10 to the minus 11. So now the, the acid didn't change much. The conjugate uh, base, no, or the conjugate acid didn't change much. And we have a tiny amount of free base left in the solution. In terms of percent ionization, it's this piece divided by this plus that. And so it's 100% ionized. Think about this, though. It, we could do this um, pH calculation, but, but just look at the problem. Uh, if I were to ask you how much is ionized, we're taking a base and we're putting it in acid. So all of those basic molecules are going to be protonated. And the protonated base is the plus. It's the BH plus. So that's the ionized piece. If you protonate a base, then that base is ionized. It's important for us to understand oh, when something's ionized because that determines if it's water soluble or not. So the ions are what make something water soluble. This is an organic molecule. It does not want to go into water as the free base. If you're given an option, next time we'll talk about liquid-liquid extraction. If given an option, the free base will go into organic solution because it's an organic molecule. But if I protonate that base, it's going to go into aqueous solution. So this is a really important judgment is whether it's ionized or not. Okay. So this also has a physiological effect too. The stomach has a really low pH. And so that's going to be where the bases are protonated. And so your basic drugs are going to be absorbed to the stomach. And they're going to go right into the bloodstream very quickly. So if you want something that's fast acting, you want it to um, be absorbed in the stomach. Right when it, you know, it hits your stomach, it's going to get protonated. It's going to be water soluble. It's going to go into the aqueous blood system. And so that's going to be fast acting. If you want something that's time release, you want to modify, maybe it's, maybe it's in a capsule that um, is uh, like a, maybe some sort of cellulosic capsule that's going to have to undergo acid hydrolysis and to break down. And so it'll break down in the stomach, but then it'll move into the colon. And uh, acids are deprotonated in the colon because it's a little bit more basic. And so those, those form acid anions, and they'll go into the body through the colon. So let's look at drug absorption. And in this case, we have this drug up here, phenedimetrazine tartrate. Okay. And again, it's, a, it's an organic base. Whenever they give you the organic bases, or whatever, they still give you the KAs. And so this is a KA of 7.6 for that, for that nitrogen. So when it's protonated, it's acting as an acid, and that proton comes off when the pH goes above 7.6. When the pH is below 7.6, then this is, this, is, uh, this is protonated. When it's above 7.6, it's deprotonated. And so in the stomach, we have a buffered system. So the pH of the stomach, we say, is 1. OK, you see that over here. And the nice thing about buffered systems is that they, they maintain their pH. So no matter what you put in, I mean, again, within a reasonable amount, you can you know, cause your stomach to be more acidic or less acidic by taking in acids and things like that. But in general, whatever you eat, that stomach is responding with its acid pumps and trying to maintain that pH of one. So we put in, let's say, one unit of this uh, protonated base reacts with the water, it's in a buffered pH, so the hydronium ion concentration is constant. And so we have very little moving to the right because in the products we have this, this acid concentration of pH 1. So very little, X is very small. And so we can assume again that this is a, a unchanged. And so we just have one variable, which is very nice. So 100% ionized. And here's our, our equilibrium constant expression. So we have 0.1 for the acid concentration, 
one for the base concentration, and then the, the, the free base is x. Solving for x, we have 2.5 times 10 to the minus 7. So a really small amount, this right here, that x is 10 to the minus 7. That's the protonated form of the base here, and so it's 100% ionized. As you might imagine, again, we've got a base in the stomach where it's acidic, so it's going to be a protonated base. What about in the colon where the pH is 7.6? Now, in this particular case, we have a, a coincidence. The pKa for this acid is 7.6, and the colon concentration is 7.6. So you don't even have to do the ice table on this one. Whenever the pKa equals the pH, you're halfway to um, uh, ionization. So your reaction is right in the middle. And so you have 50% on either side. So we have 50% protonated, 50% non-protonated. But let's just show that mathematically, okay? So once again, we have a buffered pH but in, in this case, it's not 0.1, it's 10 to the minus 7.6. Okay, if we put that number in, then we get the 2.5 times 10 to the minus 8. Okay, in the change row, this is buffered, so it's unchanged. So that's a big point there. Same thing up here, this was buffered and unchanged. Um, and so then uh, we do our x's again it's a small change because it's a buffered system and so then we do the math over here so we have the the um, 10 to the minus 7.6 which is also the, the 2.5 times 10 to the minus 8 and so essentially we could cancel those two numbers and this is one on the left so we can move this over to the left and then move the x back and so it's 1 equals 2x or x equals 0.5 and so X is 0.5, so we subtract that from 1, we get 0.5 of the BH plus, 0.5 of the B, and it's 50% ionized. So it's 100% ionized in the stomach and only half ionized in the colon. If it were to make it through the stomach and get to the colon, then uh, it would only be half ionized. So it's going to be more soluble in the stomach than it is in the colon. Any questions on this one? Again, just using ice tables to follow the percent ionization. We can simplify things a little better, too. This is that percent ionization equation. So this is the part. That's the ionized part. We're looking at that ion right there. And this is the hole. Now, um, we could flip this because I want to I want to get I want to split this into two terms. And so I'm going to turn this upside down. So one over percent I is equal to H A plus A over A minus. This is a de common denominator. And so I can move this. I can split it and have H A over A divided by or uh, plus A over A. And so this A over A becomes one and I have H A over A minus. Now I'm going to try to get these variables on their own. And so essentially I'm going to, I'm going to um, move that, that one over to the other side and then flip left and right. So hopefully you see that I subtracted one from both sides and then I reversed it. So I've solved for HA over A minus. Now that's a nice useful term. Let's look for this in the equilibrium constant expression. I have A minus over HA, which we can flip later. What if I take the minus log of this? So here's our equilibrium constant expression. And I'm going to take the minus log of both sides. So I have the pKa. And this right here, this piece gives me the pH. And then I have the minus log of this ratio. What if I flip this? If I flip this, I change the sign of the log. So I have A minus over HA. This right here would be like C base over C acid. So that's the conjugate base over the conjugate acid. If I go and make that up, that's how I make a buffer solution. So y'all seen that as the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. 
And what drives me crazy is I can't believe that they got an equation named after themselves when they just took the minus log of both sides. It's two lines. They started here and went one, two, and got an equation named after themselves. And that's ridiculous. So um, <clears throat> I'm going to take this, this ratio and put in the percent ionization piece that I've put over here. So that's going to enter over here. And then I'm going to rearrange and try to solve for that percent ionization. So I'm gonna move this to the other side and move pH over here. So I swapped pH and the, the log P's. And then I'm gonna raise both sides, 10 to the both sides. So I get this piece down here and I have 10 to that difference. Now I move the one over and invert everything and I have the percent ionization is equal to one over one plus 10 raised to the power of the difference of the pKa and the pH. And that's going to tell me the percent ionization for an acid. Now that's a whole bunch of steps. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven steps. So I think I need to get a name after that equation. This is so so I I, I did the algebra on this a few years ago and then they, they came up with the second edition of the book. And they put it in the book. And I was like, oh, he stole my equation. I don't know if they saw my YouTube video or what, but uh, it wasn't in the first edition. I did this, and then it shows up in the second edition. So who knows? So, yeah, I think I've been scooped. So, so anyway, this is a nice equation, but this is, notice HA and A minus throughout, okay? So this is for an acid, and we're using pKa. So this is really for the percent ionization of an acid, which is an important thing. Because if you have a reaction, HA goes to A minus. Notice that the deprotonated form is the ionized piece. Everybody catch that? It's been deprotonated. What if I have a base? B goes to B H plus. Okay, it's the protonated form that is the ionized for the base. And so this is inverted for bases. If you don't know that and you use my equation incorrectly, you're going to get exactly the opposite answers. So this is a picture of that. Here's the pKa's. Let's say we have a pKa of 4, right? If I'm below, like right here, so this goes along and shoots up here like this. And right here at 50%, 50 it comes down and that is a pH of 4. So if I'm if my pKa is 4 equals 4 and my pH is 4, I'm right at 50% ionized. Okay? If my pH goes higher than 4, it's in a basic solution and I'm going to deprotonate that acid. So if my pH is 5 or 6 or 7, or eight, then I have A minus, because I'm in a basic solution and I'm looking for protons. And I find this acid and I steal all of its protons, because it only holds on to them with a pKa of four. If I'm at pH of five, I'm basic, I'm gonna steal the proton, okay? But if I'm at a pH of three, I've got excess protons. So that acid's gonna be protonated and it's gonna be neutral. So we're trying to figure out where is it ionized? Ionized is the key. So A minus, this is water soluble or blood soluble if it's ionized. Okay. So now let's think about bases. And this is the equation that will tell me that percent. So this is essentially the plot of that equation. Um, for bases, just calculate the percent um, ionized using the pKa. Okay. But then the percent ionized base is one minus that. So you can still use that equation. You can still use pKa. But if you know you're using a base, you're talking about a base, then you just one minus it. And that's going to be the percent ionization of the base. See, it's the opposite diagram. Now up here we have BH plus. And so if my, if my pKa for the base is 4 and my pH is 4, then I'm right at 50% ionized. But if I'm less than that, I've got excess protons. And here's a base. You want a proton? Here, I've got plenty. So if I'm at pH 3, I've got plenty of protons relative to that base. And if I'm at a pH of 5, I'm 
stealing protons. So I'm going to steal that proton from the BH plus, and it's going to be not ionized. So I think this is one of the most important concepts for the next set of discussions when we talk about partitioning, aqueous solubility, uh, the organic solubility, is you, the ionized things go into solution. And if you don't know which, which side you're on or what's going to be ionized, then you're going to get those exactly opposite. And, and so we don't want to do that. We want to get them right. Now, there's a lot of compounds that have um, multiple acidic protons, or they might have a basic group and an acid group, kind of like amino acids. They have a base on one end and, a, and, a, and an acid on the other. And so that's another reason why we just use PKAs, because we have all these different PKAs. And in this case, uh, when you're between both PKAs, that's when your, your um, solubility is lowest. If you're all the way to the basic side, then you've deprotonated uh, all the acids and you have an anion, so anion. And then if you're all the way to the acidic side, you've got a BH plus. Um, and so it's in the middle when the thing is neutral that it's going to be less water soluble. So if you have multiple PKAs, you just have to think your way through where it's going to be ionized and where it's not and whether it's an acid group or a, or a basic group. Okay. And so uh, we, we've covered some ground pretty quick, so we're done. So let's go ahead and stop the recording. We can, I can answer your questions if you want.